Well, good morning. Welcome to the river. It is a joy to have you here. You beat the traffic as the bicycle races are coming through town. You made it. You made it here. Good job. Let's stand to our feet. Greet those around you. Amen. why Paul gets to make the delivery. That's good. Good thing my foot's on this pedal, otherwise it... My pedal's being feisty. Is that better? <laughs> oh, you might have heard me say some other things than earlier. <laughs> Interesting. Nice. What a joy. Um, it's, it's good to be here this morning. Happy Easter. Third week into the season. We get a chance to worship together. This is our call to worship in our third week leading into uh, the Ascension season. But this is our call to worship this morning. This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never put it out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Christ is our peace, the indestructible peace we now share with each other. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen.
in the waiting. The same God who never fails is working all things out. You're working all things out. Of Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will, will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with the songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name, sing like this. Oh, 
That's what we're here to do, isn't it? Yeah. To worship the Lord and give thanks to Him, to praise Him for everything that He's done for us. And I've still got a reason to pray, praise. Whether you've come here and you're in the uh, darkest moments of your time or whether you're here celebrating, you've still got a reason to praise. Amen. We'd like to welcome you here. I'm Pastor Rick, one of the pastors here at the River, pastor of visitation. If you're, if you're joining us by social media, welcome. We're glad that you're joining us. If you're visiting with us, a special word of welcome. We hope that you'll uh, take a moment to go out to the connection point after service and find out a little bit more about us and hopefully give us a little bit of information about you. And uh, there are cards in the, in the benches. If you'd like to leave us with your information, we'd love to be able to have that. But we're glad that you're here, and we're glad to be able to worship the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Jeff, you've got some announcements for us? Yeah, we're going to start with a video. I'm going to invite Mario up to, to do our first announcement as that video starts. Uh, this is our, uh, you may have a seat, absolutely. And this is our start of our serve announcement. <laughs> Sing, Mario. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm Pastor Mario, also one of the pastors here at the River, Pastor of Faith Formation. And this summer, actually in a week from this coming, from next Sunday, we will be hosting Serve. Serve is a part of a 
a nonprofit called Youth, uh, Youth Limit, Therefore Go Ministries. Therefore Go Ministries hosts uh, these sites called Serve all across North America from June all the way to the end of July. And what these sites are intended to do is to bring students to a location to partner with the local church to go share the love of Jesus through service in the community. There are 23 Serve sites this year, and we are one of them. We're one of the first ones. We are hosting it in June, June 20. Second through June 29th, we are hosting, uh, as of right now, 65 high school students and leaders from all across uh, North America, Arizona, Minnesota, Colorado, Indiana. There's a, quite a few. So we are hosting and we're excited. We did this last year. So if you're seeing stuff and you're like, didn't we do that last year? You're absolutely right. And then maybe you're asking, don't we host every other year? You're, op you're also absolutely right. This year we decided to host again um, just to get momentum going and we wanted to be helping out the ministries and just uh, be a location where God can use us in mighty ways. And so there are ways for us to be involved in this. If you're wondering, how can I be involved? Let me let you know, okay? Uh, we have, um, we are asking for donations in the foyer. There's going to be a table filled with things that you can sign up to bring. If you don't like going to the store, if you're more like a door dasher and just like, ah, I'll just have it delivered, or you're like, you know what, I don't feel like shopping, can I just write you a check? There's also envelopes out there too that you can help, that you can donate a specific amount that helps us cover the costs of food and other things that we're not asking donations for. And so there's plenty of ways to be involved. As we get closer to serve, there are other ways to be involved. We're going to be asking people to be praying for our students who are coming here. We're going to be praying for our students who are part of our church who are going to be serving uh, the serve team. And so, yes, there is many different ways for you to be involved. Maybe it's worship. You can talk to Jeff. Uh, Nate Chamstra will be speaking again this year, so we're super excited about that. If you have any questions about Sir, feel free to find me in the foyer after the service. That's what I got this morning, Jeff. I got the rest of them for you this morning. A joy to, to be able to share the rest of our uh, announcements this morning. Uh, as I think about our next announcements, I'm, I'm announcing that Care Group 4 is meeting today in the Fellowship Hall after the service. I'm in part of Care Group 4. Uh, I know Raj Borson is a part of Care Group 4, and he is here this morning. He just got a pacemaker installed this week, and he's doing well. God bless you, sir. I don't mean to bring attention to you, but I'm just overjoyed that God is, uh, God is healing you well, and, and here you are just uh, smiling and worshiping with us. So we continue to pray for your recovery, Mr. Raj Borson, and for Carolyn and the rest of the family as they support you as you continue to, to heal. Uh, but thanks for always being a part. For those of you who don't know uh, Raj Borson, he's been involved in ministry here since before I was even around. Uh, he's he's just has the best service heart. He and his wife both have served so much, and he sings on uh, on our third week um, every every month uh, on our worship team, as well as just being an awesome leader in this community. So we continue to pray for you, sir. And um, if you are uh, finding that you need something to do after the race, I know that the bicycle race is in town today. Uh, the, the men's race is between two and five, but right after that, you might have something that you want to do, which is come here and enjoy a choir concert by the Bonner Singers. Uh, Wayne Pumphrey, who has helped us get our sound installed in diff different ways or upgraded through the COVID season, um, is running sound for them, and Mario and I are both CBU graduates, and we've got connections with uh, the Judd Bonner who directs the group, and there's going to be about 40 of them coming and blessing us through song for about 90 minutes. Um, this evening at 5 o'clock, please come. There will be a um, free will donation opportunity for you uh, to give back to them as they share with you. That is 5 o'clock tonight. I know uh, Rick is a, is a big star in our, in our church as well as for our seniors. He is hosting a brunch for lunch on April 26th. That's going to be at 1130. Please sign up today in the back in the lobby there where you uh, get an opportunity to, to be a part of an awesome ministry and to, to share in something that Pastor Rick uh, is a fantastic leader over. Uh, we do have an all-church workday that was postponed a couple weeks back. That's going to be on April 27th. That's at 8 o'clock in the morning. We're going to gather together projects for all ages, uh, depending on who signs up, depends on which projects we can do. And so please, everybody sign up that can, and we'll get an opportunity to upgrade our campus. We're also excited. Our, our prayer and worship team uh, gets a chance to host you all in a national day of prayer this coming May 2nd. 
It's a Thursday, an opportunity for us to gather together. Uh, there will be a dinner. There's also an opportunity for you to fill out a 15-minute slot to pray. We as a church are invited to fill up a 24-hour period of time to pray as a church, to pray for your church and the, the many other things that are on our list. That will also culminate in our evening dinner time where we will spend some time not only communing together but also praying together. And there'll be some opportunity to sign up starting next week in the lobby as well as on a QR code that should be right there in front of you. There you go. Um, many of you have been around in this church for a lot of years. You will remember that in the mid-2010s, uh, we had a, a, a wonderful ministry flourishing at Lagonia Elementary School. That ministry uh, is now, the door is opening for some more opportunity there. And so we're thankful for what God is doing through uh, some of the relationships. We have an opportunity to have a work day there on May 11th. Uh, that's going to be from 8 to 12. There's going to be various projects on campus and a chance for us to get back on their campus uh, to continue to pray for them and to, to be a help to them as a church body. If you are a visitor here, we, of course, welcome you and are thankful for your involvement. We do invite you to join us in our Next Steps class that will start next week after the service. Uh, if you want more information on that, Karen Verhoeven is the name, and Karen at the River CRC is how you get a hold of her. And uh, I believe that is all of our announcements for today. Thanks for uh, enjoying the so many great opportunities to serve here at the River. I know there's, okay, I see a slide. Can I announce that one too? The men's breakfast, third Saturday, 7 a.m., every third Saturday. Thanks, Harold and Paul and uh, so many of you who are uh, leaders over that ministry. Fantastic. Our offering this morning will be for CEF, and we have a chance to pray for that. Let's pray together. Lord, what a blessing it is to have a community that so loves our kids and invests into their lives, not only here at our church, but being able to support families who send their kids in Christian education. What a joy it is to be able to show them Christ in their lives as they learn, as they go to church, as they spend time with your community. May you continue to bless that ministry. May you continue to bless those families who sacrifice to send their kids to Christian education. May your hand be at work in it all. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. We not only have our CEF, but our first basket that will be coming around is for our general fund as well, the River Life Fund.
like to invite the children to come up for the blessing as they go to uh, Children's Church this morning. Hey, hey, we got a young lady got here quick. Good morning. Good to see you guys. Hi. Good. Always good to see a good crowd. So we're going to bless you as we always do. And what do we say? Me. Me. Okay, would you turn to the congregation? The congregation is first going to bless you, and then we're going to bless them back. One, two, three. May you always know God's love. And kids, one, two, three. May you always know God's love too. Blessings as you go. Our word this morning is coming out of James chapter 1, James chapter 1, beginning our reading at verse 19, James chapter 1, verse 19 through 27. As you're turning to God's word, let me just take a moment this morning. Raj, we are glad to see you, glad you're feeling better. I know you're still kind of recuperating and recovering, and uh, we want to continue to pray for you. We have two other people in the hospital this morning, Albert Compass is in the hospital. He had a procedure, went home, and then had to go back to the hospital. And um, um, he is um, heavily medicated. And uh, they've asked that, uh, the family has asked that if we have folks that would be willing to stop up and see Al, who would jog his memory. So we're looking particularly for folks that, that Al would recognize, that would be willing to go up and and uh, say hello to Al. Um, if you're willing to do that, please see me after the service, and uh, we'll try to set up something so that uh, Al is being visited on a kind of regular basis. Also, Larry Zollner has been in a hospital for a number of days. He did move from intensive care to transitional care, and so he's starting to make some progress. It was good to see a smile on his face and a little bit of humor as he, we laughed together yesterday. Hadn't seen that for about 10 days, so glad to do that. Let's just pray for them a minute. Lord Jesus, we lift you. Al and Larry, as they're in the hospital, we thank you for the promise of your presence with them. We pray, Lord, that your hand would be upon them. We anoint them with our prayers across the distance. Father, we lay hands upon them in our prayers, and we ask, Lord Jesus, that even now that they would sense your presence and closeness. For Al, Lord, as he is sometimes confused and heavily medicated, Lord, that you would just touch him. And for Larry, Lord, we thank you for the recovery that he's making. We pray for that to continue. Bless and keep these two, Lord, who are among our nanogenarians, and we bless them and thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. I'd ask you to stand if you're able for the reading of God's word. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it, do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed by what they do, in what they do. Those who consider themselves righteous, religious, and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after the orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As we look at the Word of God this morning, we are in a series looking at transformation. And I love the artwork, Terry. I don't know if you did that or someone else did, but I love the artwork because it helps us to see the fire of Pentecost that's going to be coming. And uh, just, just to remind us that the Spirit of God is what brings transformation into our lives. But we're anxious to see transformation happen. If you're the same person today and you know Jesus, and you're the same person today that you were five or ten years ago, then we need to talk. Because there needs to be a, 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 a process of transformation in our lives. Now, we're never going to be perfect this side of heaven, and we're always going to struggle with sin, but hopefully the sin we're dealing with today we're dealing with in a different way than we were dealing with five or ten years ago. Hopefully, we're making progress. One of my friends said, I'm so tired of that. I don't seem to be making the progress that I'd like, and why do I continue to sin? And we said, you know, you're in good company. Romans 7, Paul said, why do I do the things I don't like to do and I don't do the things that I should do? We're kind of stuck in that rut, but if we're cycling and doing the same thing over and over again and we can't look at ourselves and say, hey, I'm somehow transformed over the years, then we need to work at that. And James talks particularly about transformation in our behavior, transformation in our righteousness, a transformation that makes our religion, I don't like that word, I kind of stumble over that word, but we know what he means. Religion that is pure. Today, as we look at the text, I'd like to look at three things in particular. There are, uh, James, James jumps all over the place, you know, throw in little kind of proverbial phrases, and you got to kind of work to put it all together. But, but I'd like to look at three things here this morning. One is our situation. Our situation, that we are in the world, but not of the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. There's something different about us. And then our goal, what is our goal? Our goal is to produce the righteousness that God desires. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. We are in the world, but not of the world. Our goal is to produce the righteousness that God desires. And then I'd like to suggest that the Scripture this morning gives us sort of a pathway, or at least some suggestion about how to do this transformation through the Word of God. Our situation, our passage this morning begins, my dear brothers and sisters. Now, we need to go back to James chapter 1, verse 1, and hopefully you have your scripture on phone or some kind of a device or in print. James chapter 1, verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. So James says in the passage that we have this morning, my dear brothers and sisters, but what he's specifically writing to is to the 12 tribes, particularly the Jewish folks or the people that James is writing to. We don't need to be exclusive about that, but that's who he wrote the original letter to. To the 12 tribes, where? Scattered throughout the nations. So he's not looking particularly at the people that are in Jerusalem, but he's looking at those that, that are in the diaspora, those that have been scattered throughout the nations, beginning with the persecutions of Babylon and the exiles of Babylon, all the way through uh, to, to what's happening in the Roman world. And so these people are distributed out in the world. Now as we think about that, we hear... Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, verse 15 and 16. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, 
but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. So Jesus didn't pray for his, his disciples to be taken out of the world. Rather, he was sending them into the world. But as he was doing that, he was also saying, you're not of the world. Hence, we get that phrase that many of us know and can roll off our tongues. We are in the world, but not of the world. That's Jesus' desire for us, to be in the world, reaching the world, but not of the world. Now, the problem with that is that as believers, when we are in the world, something can happen to us. And that is that we become more like the world than like Christ and changing the world. Are you with me? And when we talk like that, when we understand that, we understand that what James is connecting with with his first century believers speaks to us really loudly and relevantly today. As I look around at our faith today, it seems like faith in politics, faith in our nationality, and and, and faith in moral values often get confused, and that in some ways, the church begins to look more like the world than like Jesus. That we can become argumentative with each other, whether we're red or blue or purple. A post on Facebook can be answered with some kind of a controversial and hard response. Seems like it doesn't matter what you say today. And this is what was happening in the church as James was writing. The church in the world had begun begun to look like the church of the world. And James is concerned about that. Last week, we heard that there were many Christians facing trials. You can imagine that as people were living in their settings, that many of the Christians were poor. They didn't necessarily have good jobs. And they were facing trials by being people in exile. My wife and I were talking about some of the people we know. We know a a lawyer from China who practiced corporate law. He comes here, where's he working, Glad In a convenience store or something. Not able to do what he was trained to do and having to have humble beginnings. So the church was experiencing economic problems, they were experiencing socioeconomic problems, but then within the church, there were also some problems that we're gonna hear about as we go on in the book. That is that there was conflict between the rich and the poor. It's alluded to in, in, in verse nine of chapter one. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation. There was was this economic uh, thing that was going on and and there was tension between the rich and the poor. Chapter two, verse six says that the rich were dishonoring the poor. And further on in the book it says, and the poor wanted to be like the rich, but when they asked for what they needed, they asked with the wrong motives. They were really asking because they wanted to be rich. They had forgotten about seeking first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. There was favoritism being shown based on whether you had power and wealth. People were arguing about who who were the real and rightful teachers and who had the wisdom to be able to teach. And some that weren't teachers wanted to be teachers. There, were anger, there was anger, anger and quarrels and slandering of one another in the church. 
And as we move along in the book of James, hopefully you'll see some of these things. And in fact, in James chapter 4, verse 4, James gets to the point that he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means intimacy with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. What he's saying here is not so much that it's, it's a problem to exist in the world and have friends in the world, but when we take on the values of the world and we begin to look like the world looks instead of looking like Jesus looks, that there's a problem there. And so the context of the scripture this morning is he opens with my brothers and sisters to the 12 tribes gathered among the nations is dear brothers and sisters, you are in the world but not of the world. I'd invite us to consider for ourselves and for our churches. Are we in the world and not of the world? Are we looking like Jesus? Or are we looking like everybody else around us? James continues. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Our goal is to produce the righteousness that God desires. As we look at this scripture this morning, Proverbs, and then remember Proverbs 15, 9, for instance, says, the Lord detests the way of the wicked, but he loves those who pursue righteousness. Our goal is to produce the righteousness that God desires desires. Now, just taking a a moment, first the word says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. In verse 26, he says, those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves, and their religion isn't is worthless. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul agrees with this as he says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, and under every form of malice. In Colossians, he says, now rid yourself of all things such as these, anger and malice and slander and filthy language from your lips. He says in 1 Timothy 2, 8, I want men everywhere people everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing. James 3 says all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now I'm going to ask you to just take those words and tuck them away for a week or two because in James chapter 3, he goes on and talks about taming the tongue. And so this morning, that's one of the things that he mentions about pursuing the righteousness of God. But I want to skip over that a minute because there's something else that's unique to this passage. And so I don't want to go into that too much. But he does say everyone should be quick to listen, slow to anger, and slow to become angered because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Our goal is to produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, just very quickly, and we get into this later in, John, in, in James 2 when, when James is talking about uh, faith and works, And so I don't want to go into it too deeply, but I do want to talk just a moment about righteousness and and, and, and acknowledge that there are two kinds of righteousness that we're talking about. One is the righteousness that comes by faith. The other has to do with faith. The, The other has to do with faith, but it has to do with the fruits produced by our faith. Are you with me? So one is a righteousness of faith, the other is a righteousness 
of fruit that comes by way of faith. We need to make no mistake. Romans chapter 3 says, righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Ephesians says, and that's familiar to many of us, for it is by grace you have been saved, not by works. I'm sorry, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it's a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. So our righteousness in our being comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you haven't made that step of faith and you're here this morning, you're thinking about it, but you've not made that step of faith, we'd love to see you come to that point. And if the Holy Spirit talks to you today, we'll have people up here in front after service that would love to pray with you, and I'd like to talk to you. We'd like to see you to come to know Jesus. It's a righteousness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. But the scripture also says that the faith that we have produces fruit. And that too is a kind of righteousness. The faith that comes through, I mean, I'm sorry, the righteousness that comes through faith produces fruit or it isn't any good. James 2 is going to talk about that. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can that faith save them? Matthew 3.10, Jesus says, the axe is ready at the root of the trees and every fruit that do, every tree that does not produce fruit will be cut down and what? Thrown into the fire. Folks, we stand fast on the truth that faith, I mean that our righteousness is by faith in Jesus Christ. But But the reality is faith without works is... You see, if I gave you a $100 bill and you were all excited, and I had this happen once, by the way, dear little old lady that I was... Ministering to in Valencia Commons in Rancho Cucamonga gave me $100 in the offering and I took it to the bank. Found out it was counterfeit. (laughs) But suppose I gave you a $100 bill and you were all excited looking at that and then you turned it over and the other side was blank. What would you say? That's counterfeit. You see, you can't have one without the other. See, I'm old enough to remember a jingle goes through my mind as soon as I say that. You can't have one without the other. Faith without works is dead. There is a righteousness, the righteousness that is ours in our being comes through faith in Jesus Christ, but that, but that works itself out in the fruitfulness that God would have for us. <clears throat> First verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 26, or 27. Religion that our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted in the world. We are in the world, but not of the world. Our goal is to produce fruit, to produce righteousness that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, as we look at this, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, eat, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the fruit of righteous, the righteousness that God desires. Our desire, our, our goal is to produce the righteousness that God desires. In verse 21, he continues, therefore, right? In other words, therefore, there's a reason for this. Producing the righteousness that God desires involves getting rid of all the moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. The first thing when we talk about the pathway is that we are called to get rid of moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. 
Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said it this way. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. Now, he didn't mean that literally. What he was saying is, if there's something that's causing you to sin, get rid of it. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than the whole body to be thrown into hell. Paul said in Ephesians 21, 4.21, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him according to the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with your former way of life to put off your old self. So are you with me? Part of the pathway to a righteousness, to the righteousness that, um, uh, that, that God desires is to put off evil. And that say, it takes some doing. Romans chapter 6, Paul said, Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? James says in chapter 4 that we'll get to, submit yourself to God and resist the devil. See, we are called to put away those things in our life that are not pleasing to God. Now, that's a lifelong process. We'll never achieve that perfectly. And if we do have a gain in one area, the Lord will show us another one. You know, oh, Lord, I thought I was done with that. Well, you're doing pretty good over there, but let me show you this now. Because he's sanctifying us, he's making us holy in a process by which we're putting away some things. Now, folks, I don't know what you need to put away. I don't know what you need to get rid of that comes out of your old person. That's, that's different for each one of us. I know I've got my stuff. I can almost guarantee that you've got your stuff because if you were perfect, the Lord would take you home. So we are called to a process of putting away the moral filth that's so prevalent in our world. You know, when I was a kid, we always said that sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I don't know what the big three are today. But I know there's all kinds of other things, like envy, you know, like jealousy. There's all kinds of things. Anger. Scott talks about driving the 91. I drove the 91 the other day. The Lord freed me. It was clear, and I was able to drive. <laughs> but I don't have a bumper stick on my car that says, honk if you love Jesus, because... I'm always worried about what I'm saying to the traffic in front of me. But we are called to rid ourselves. And that takes, that takes some effort. That takes some energy. It takes some intestinal fortitude to stop and say, I'm not going to do that. We need to have a refrigerator magnet in our heads that sort of alert us. Okay, Lord, that's not pleasing to you. I need to put that away. So, so the pathway, our, 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 our situation is that we are in the world but not of the world. Our goal is to produce a righteousness that's desirable and pleasing to God. And, and, and the pathway begins, or one side of that, is to put away the old self and to put away sin. But there's a second part to this. As we look at the Scripture this morning, he goes on and says... Therefore, get a rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. And then we got that little word. What's that word? And. Okay? Just a little conjunction there. And humbly accept the word planted in you that can save you. You see, the process is, as Paul said, put off the old man and put on the new. So the pathway, the process toward attaining the righteousness that God deserves is to put off the old, but to put on the new. And, and, and the word of God says to, to, um, um, to, to, let me find the verse again here. Where am I? Accept the word planted in you that can save you. 
In John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus says, praying for his disciples, sanctify them by your truth. And your word is truth. When Jesus was being tempted, he said to the devil, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Paul said in Romans 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, there's some mind work that needs to be done. This thing about knowing Jesus isn't just a warm, comfortable, emotive thing, but there's mind work that needs to be done. And the mind work has to do with the Word. And the Scripture says this morning to put away the moral filth and humbly accept the Word that is planted in you. Now, the word accept means to, to take, to receive, to grasp, to welcome in, to receive that which God has planted in us. The word humble says to do that with meekness. It's kind of the opposite of what James is writing about with the, with the slander and the anger and the quarrelsome, boastful ways that James has been critical of. Humbly accept the word of God. Humbly receive it. Now that, that takes a little bit of doing. You see, Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, now catch this, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Come on now. now, I don't know about you, but when somebody calls me up, I mean calls me out, and says there's something going on in your life, I don't like it. It's pretty hard to receive that humbly. The Word of God says no person enjoys discipline when they're going through it. But here what James is saying is humbly accept the Word of God. There are going to be things in the Word of God that cut deeply into our lives. You see, we need to be in the Word of God to hear that. We need to be studying the Word of God to get that. We can't just come on Sunday morning and sing the praises and, 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 and clap at the praise team and say hallelujah, praise God. We need to be doing the work of studying the Word, and when we get into the Word, I guarantee you the Word is going to cut sharply into the depths of our souls, and it's going to convict us about things that we got going on. And through the Word of God and the living God, the living Word, there are going to be challenges. And it's going to be hard to humbly accept that. The story is told about the seminary professor who was once reading the scripture to the seminarians, and he, he said, he tore that page out of the Bible, and he said, ah, you don't believe that anyway. It's sort of easy for us to gloss over and discount those things. But to humbly accept what the Word of God says to us. The second thing, as he continues on, he said, humbly accept the Word of God planted on in you that can save. Verse 22 says what? Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. You see, the, 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 the pathway to sanctification, to transformation, the, 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 the way to achieve the goal or the way that James is setting forth to achieve this goal of faith that is acceptable, righteousness that is acceptable, is to put away moral filth 
It is to accept the word of God that's humbly planted us and then to do it. Somebody asked me a number of years ago, you, you still are going to some seminars, and I said, well, if I can get one little kernel out of a seminar, I'm glad. But I said, the truth is, I know more than I do now. And we're all in that situation, aren't we? We know more than we do. And the Word of God says to us, humbly accept what the Word of God has to say, but then we need to do it. In fact, the Word continues that a person that doesn't do that is like a person that looks into the mirror, looks at his face in the mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. You know? You might look in the mirror. There are a few of you that probably say, oh, that's pretty good. Probably more of us say, oh, that's not so good. (laughs) But then as soon as we go away, we forget what we look like, right? So, so, He said, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do it, not forgetting what they heard, but they will be blessed. We have to do what the word of God convicts us of. In fact, it's interesting when I think about this. The word for word in Hebrew is the same word as deed. What God said, he did. That's called integrity. When what we say and what we do are the same, that's integrity. We need to do it, not merely hear about it. In fact, Jesus said this, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who builds his house upon the rock. The rain comes down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, but it didn't fall because it has its foundation as the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish person who built their house on a sand. The rain comes, the stream rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Word and deed. And then the third thing that we hear as we look, move along, verse 25, whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed. The third thing, the first thing was what? To humbly accept. Second thing is to do what you hear. And what's the third thing? To look intently into the word to look intently into the word. Now the word here for looking intently means to bend down, stoop over, to make an effort to examine and exerting an effort to look at. So that means we need to be in the word studying it. Are you with me? Looking intently into the word. And, and, and so as we hear this word, the word of God speaking to us today, What we hear from James is a concern for the people in his life, the people that are out in the world, living it out in reality is, folks, you all are looking a little bit more like the world than you are Jesus. There's some problems happening. We got strife between the rich and the poor. We got, you know, people wanting to be teachers and those that think they're teachers and got all that. We got got quarrels. We got strife. Y'all need to get your act together. And so he's, he's, he's simply saying, throughout this book, he gives a whole list of things that he wants the folks to correct. And in the midst of this, so we, what we hear is that we are in the world but not of the world. And that our goal is a righteousness that is pleasing and desirable to God a religion that is, that is pure. And he says that is to take care of the orphans and the widows and to um, keep oneself from being polluted in the world. The pathway, the pathway that James lays out for us here is that we need to be in a process of putting away the old person, putting away the sin, 
getting rid of that stuff. We'll never be perfect at that, and it's a hard thing. On the other hand, we need to be students of the Word, in the Word, humbly accepting it, doing what it says, and examining it intently, stooping over, exerting an uh, uh, effort to be able to hear what it says and then doing it. And this will bring us a blessing. He says they will be blessed in what they do. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart, and the commandments of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Dear brothers and sisters, we are in the world, but not of it. May we always be looking to how our lives bring honor and glory to God and reflect a righteousness that God desires, a religion that is pure. And may we be engaged in a lifelong process of putting off the old and putting on the new by humbly accepting the word, doing what it says, and exerting effort to see how it speaks to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, speak to us, bless us. Lord, we have heard your word this morning. Help us not to be like those that look into a mirror and then go away and forget what we look like. Continue to call to mind, Lord, the reality of our situation, that we are made new in Christ Jesus, that we are saints with a sin problem, and help us to be continually working to put away the sin that is on us and putting on the righteousness that you desire so that we might be made new in Christ Jesus, even as we have been declared to be new. And we give you all the thanks, all the honor, and all the glory. And God's people said, amen. Amen. Please stand and join us.
the Lord has laid something on your heart today, whether it's that as you've been thinking about where you're at with Jesus, you've never made a commitment to him and would like to do that this morning, we're going to have people up front that would pray with you. Maybe it's that you've known Jesus, but your walk isn't faithful with him, and you would just like to pray with somebody and maybe just confess that to somebody. We'd like to pray with you for that. Maybe you have another need in your life. Maybe there's something physical you need prayed for. Maybe there's a relationship. Maybe it's just some concern on your heart. We'll have people up here in front that would be willing to pray with you after this service, and we'd welcome you to come. If you've come and visited and you're going to be leaving, stop by the checkpoint. It's not a checkpoint, is it? What is it called? Visitor's connection point. (laughs) Stop by the connection point. Get a cup of coffee. Let us fellowship with you. But if you'd love prayer, we'll be up here. God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, move and work among us, Lord. Do what only you can do. Lord, teach us those things in our heart that we need to change, Lord. And then work in us, Lord, as only your Holy Spirit can do to change those things, Lord. And we'll give you thanks and all the honor and all the glory, Lord, because we know that what we're really doing is about trying to live lives that honor and glorify you. That we can live in the world, Lord, and be known by our love. And so, Lord, bless us as we leave this place. We ask, Lord, that you bless us with this age-old blessings. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face upon you and give you peace, now and forever. Amen.